Sheffield Insight Meditation has some vacancies for trustees. The trustees, in principle, are the people who make the decisions for the organisation, um, organise retreats and so on. And then we also have vacancies for helpers. Um, I know a lot of you have helped with um, practical things like moving cushions and so on. Uh, we also need le people from the next level up to organise helpers. Um, it can be challenging, but also very rewarding. It's a form of service, deepening practice. So if you're interested in that, talk to us at the end. Talk to me or mary or Catherine, which isn't in here yet. Catherine makes announcements here. So. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And uh, just to kind of support that, I understand from running my own charity how it's fairly difficult to find, uh, you know, people who can serve on trusts and as long-term volunteers. But really, these things can only happen. Our retreats can only happen with those people who are willing to commit and invest some time. And it's a, such a beautiful way of serving Dhamma, because so long as practice remains only a personal thing, it doesn't really have the kind of ripple effect and the real effect on the world at large. So, you know, these things may appear to run very smoothly because of the hard work of people like Julian and Mary Ann, who's been hosting me, and Catherine, who's on the desk over there, and so many other people. Um, but it's actually, yeah, it, it's a responsibility that's extremely rewarding, as you say, and um, doesn't happen easily. A lot of preparation goes into these things. So, yeah, really hoping that you can. Uh, build up your team <laughs> good so recording in progress <laughs> I like this lady she tells me when to start <laughs> okay um, so very warm welcome to everybody here I think most of you've been with us now for the three days but I do see some new people are you new today and maybe are you also no you've been here you're here the first day. Okay. All oh, right. Yeah. Great. So more or less, everybody's been with us all this time. And if you are new, very warm welcome. There are also people online joining, I think, just for this day that I haven't noticed here uh, until now. So I'm very happy to see you. Uh, many of the people calling in via Zoom, there's about nine, 80 people today. I don't know if they're all actually logged on, but um, many of them are known to me and also very good in serving the Dhamma. So even though it's more intimate here, we're actually reaching a big community and hopefully we can uh, benefit from everybody's practice. You know, if they can benefit from ours and we can benefit from theirs because I know there's some very diligent practitioners on the Zoom as well. So warm welcome. And uh, today's the last day. Everything's just starting to go smoothly and the heating works and <laughs> drinks are rolling in. I mean, coffee and tea. Um, anyway, today I thought we'd go a little bit more deeply into how wisdom deepens metta and samadhi. So how the wisdom aspects of practice, which we've been practicing all along uh, through right intention mainly, how they support the deepening of loving kindness and of stillness, uh, the states of mind that can lead to deep absorptions, deep states of meditation. So maybe it's obvious that love is deepened by wisdom and also that in a sense the deeper the understanding, the insight into suffering and also the universal nature of suffering, the fact that we all must experience difficulties in our life, frustrations, disappointments, even just that low-grade sense of stress or sense of, you know, not really being quite sure what we're doing here all the time. Um, the word suffering can sometimes sound very intense, but it really encompasses any kind of discontent, any kind of less than peaceful, contented and satisfied. And when we understand the universal nature of that, the pervasive nature of that, then the only wise response is compassion, is, is metta. So for me, I try to keep that in mind, as I've said before, especially when I'm going through periods that you know, are challenging, that perhaps I can go through this and, and relate better to other people going through similar things or maybe different things. Because the more I can embrace that suffering and come into contact with it and understand 
you know, the inevitability in a sense, but also the impermanence of every conditioned state of mind, the more I can have sympathy and empathy with others when, when I encounter them in my daily life. And I can hold that space. You know, it's by holding space for our own suffering that we can hold that space where others may be going through difficulties without feeling maybe uneasy or intimidated by that. We can just be a listening ear. You know, because so often we want to fix ourselves and fix other people, but really it's just remaining present in a loving, warm, uh, embracing way that can help to really heal some of these problems in the world. So metta comes directly from what the Buddha called right view. And yesterday Shad was asking is whether right is a good translation of uh, any of these factors of the path. And I was thinking about it a little bit like... Uh, say you want to go through a certain course to get into university there's certain books and reading material that's the right material to read to pass your exams and it's right in the sense of it will qualify you to pass those exams if it's wise reading material it, it sounds to me more optional like okay it's wise to read that but you don't have to read that does that make sense Whereas right is something very clear and very necessary, in a sense, to accomplish one's goal. So it's not meant, again, as a value judgment, but there is such a thing as right view in the sense that it will lead to deeper wisdom, to deeper uh, love, which is the uh, next factor of the path, the, the right motivations that we bring to, to life and to the practice. Um, for those who are here, for the first time on Zoom or in person here, those uh, right motivations are motivations of um, letting go, renouncing one's selfishness in a sense, um, non-control, non-possession. That's the first, it's called nekama, uh, renunciation. And the second one is avyapada, which means non-ill will. That's a synonym for loving kindness. And the last one is avihimsaka, um, which means non-violence, non-cruelty, in other words, compassion, gentleness, even patience can be included there. So we start to become more and more motivated by these things. And yet, not only is love a means to develop wisdom, it's also a natural outcome of what wisdom really should mean. Because so often we can think that we're wise or we can be impressed by other people, the way they speak, their knowledge, the way you know, they present themselves, but unless that wisdom is resulting in an opening of the heart and of a real deepening of the intention to, to do good in the world, what really is the value of that wisdom? You know, if you're still selfish, if you're still kind of brittle and, and uh, you know, greedy and trying to exploit other people, what is the value of knowledge? You can be very intelligent, but very cruel. Whereas wisdom is something that should actually have its effect and manifest as love. And I found a lovely quote from the suttas here. It's from the Anguttara Vinikaya number four. And uh, a monk approaches the Buddha to ask, you know, when you say a person of great wisdom, one who is wise, in what way is a wise person of great wisdom? And then the Buddha answers here, a wise person of great wisdom does not intend for one's own affliction that's important. <laughs> Yesterday someone said they feel self-indulgent when they um, have thoughts of loving kindness for themselves and practice meditation, but here we shouldn't be attending for our own affliction. It's good to be happy and do things that are you know, beneficial for you. So one should not intend for their own affliction or for the affliction of others or for the affliction of both, but rather when they plan, they plan for their own welfare for the welfare of others, the welfare of both, and the welfare of the whole world. It's in this way that one is a wise person of great wisdom. So this really, um, again, feeds into the meta practice and the reason behind sometimes beginning with oneself, but then considering the other people around us, the loved person. Later on, if you would continue the metta, you could work with the neutral person, so-called, or a person you have difficulties with, and then spreading it outward to the whole world. 
So we're kind of coming from both angles. It's not that we wait until we're wise and then we have this love for the world, but we can develop this love for the world to undermine some of the obstacles to love, some of the de um, afflictive emotions that we have inside. And in that way, it will also reinforce the wisdom. So I wanted to just speak a little bit about um, what wisdom is then according to the Buddha. So as I said, it's not only what we understand, but it's measured by our virtue and our compassion. Here it's saying that we actually actively plan for the welfare of ourselves and others and the whole world. So it's not only a state of non-affliction, but it's active planning. The way, again, that we use our, our thoughts, our motivations, but that hopefully some of those motivations, some of those values that we hold issue in speech and issue in action. If they don't, then again, maybe we need to top up our cup, so to speak, that it starts to flow over and affect others too. And then obviously an aspect of right view, maybe not very obvious, but it's the insight into cause and effect. And of course, that can be taken very deeply if we want to really understand the extent of um, karma and how certain effects produce certain results. But I think it's easy enough to notice, or we can practice to notice, how when we're motivated by, say, greed or ill will or um, clinging, the opposite of renunciation, um, how that leads to suffering. And not only later on, but even when we have those states of mind, you know, very um, aversive states of mind or feelings of hostility to others, we suffer right there and then. So we can notice the cause and effect almost instantaneously. Even with things like craving, you know, often we think, oh, well, craving, clinging leads to suffering. But the very fact that you're craving is like a thirst. You know, it's like a thirst that's bothering you all the time that you want to quench. And at that moment, there cannot be contentment. So we learn to see what these roots of suffering are and we learn to address those causes and get wise as to the effects. So even if we have maybe a, um, a less than desirable effect that we're experiencing, maybe some guilt about something we've said, we can still relate to that without greed, hate and delusion. We can relate to that with love and kindness instead. Oh, just like others, I make mistakes. You know, at least I recognize that mistake and now I intend to do better next time. You know, let, let me let go of the past, maybe seek forgiveness from a person that we may be hurt and move on, intending to do better. And I think that's very relevant for today with it being the last uh, day of the year. You know, we can develop these intentions to let go and to bring forward into life the values we really cherish and hold dear. And you can never really make mistakes that are sort of intractable. You know, we do um, slip up from time to time, but I always feel that one thing that differentiates practitioners from maybe people that aren't quite so in involved or interested in understanding their minds is that we are developing good intentions, intentionally. <laughs> right? We're not just leaving it to chance. There is such a thing as cultivation and practice. So it's all a practice. It's not we've got it right. We're practicing to understand. We're practicing to understand what real metta and compassion are. So this distinguishing from the wholesome and unwholesome is a really important part of right view. And of course, anything that's unwholesome is basically what leads to more problems, more difficulties, more suffering. The Buddha says it's, uh, they also lead away from Nibbana. So they lead away from the goal of practice, which is complete freedom from suffering, or if you like, unconditional happiness that just remains calm and balanced in every situation of life. And then the wholesome, yeah, so the, the wholesome are things that lead in that way, and the unwholesome, of course, are things that lead away from it. So I thought I'd uh, talk this morning a little bit about how to use wisdom in relation to thoughts, discerning the kind of thoughts that uh, are helpful and the thoughts that are harmful. 
I don't know about people here, but mostly with meditators, thoughts are kind of one of those little irritations that plague the meditator's mind. And um, obviously they are one of the obstacles to deepening stillness. Um, so it's helpful sometimes to, to have some little methods to work with to overcome obstructive or difficult thoughts. And the other aspect I want to just touch on this morning, bearing in mind we don't have a lot of time, is um, how to distinguish between wholesome and unwholesome happiness. Because obviously that's the direction we want to move in. We want to move <coughs> towards uh, the happiness that really lasts, the happiness that has more of a taste of contentment and peace than anything we can find through the senses. So this is a sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya and it's called Two Kinds of Thought and it's quite encouraging because here even the Buddha says that he struggled with thoughts <laughs> before he was enlightened of course but he was a human being just like all of us but he had this insight and he said to himself suppose I divide my thoughts into two classes then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire thoughts of ill will and thoughts of harming. And I set on the other th side, thoughts of renunciation, of benevolence and of harmlessness. So the last three you might recognize as absolutely identical to the three right intentions. Yeah, so renunciation, benevolence, other word, in other words, metta, and the harmlessness, the non-violence. So, as he dwelled, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire, ill will, or harming arose. And then the Buddha says, I understood thus, this bad thought has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered that this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered it leads to others' affliction and to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. So sometimes just noticing those unwholesome thoughts and recognizing the damage they can do can be enough for them to subside. He didn't have to actually push them out but in that way, he does say that he abandoned them, removed them and did away with those thoughts. So simply by having that wisdom to discern, you know, which direction particular types of thoughts are leading us in. And I also think in this kind of case, it's important again to have loving kindness for oneself. Because I've noticed in my own life, when I have kind of the inner tyrant kicking off or when I'm pretty down on myself, which doesn't happen too often, but it happens from time to time. Uh, there's not so much motivation to even do things that are good for me because I don't have enough care and love for myself at that time. So even in kind of trying to discern where our own well-being lies, I think it's so important to have that sense of care and love towards ourselves first so that we want to do the wholesome to increase our own happiness. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it all feeds into the same thing, you, you know, meta through and through. <laughs> so first of all, we discern, you know, these, these thoughts and it's not that anyone else can tell you what's correct, but we can look at the roots of these things. Like, are they motivated by greed, hate and delusion or are we motivated, are the thoughts motivated by kindness, gentleness and a lack of sensual desire? And then the Buddha in the next sutta, which I don't have with me, but I can recollect most of, uh, he talks about different ways of working with thought to overcome them. And like everything in practice, there's this fine line between doing and letting be. You know, it's like when to be more active, when to be more passive and, and just ignore things that are happening. Don't give them too much attention. But there is a place uh, for substituting unwholesome thoughts and that's the first method the Buddha describes in, in this particular sutta, it's the number 19 for anyone who wants to read it, 19 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And uh, he's basically saying that when an unwholesome thought arises, we can replace it with a wholesome thought. 
So this is also what we've been doing with the practice of loving kindness. We've been intentionally bringing up wholesome thoughts, thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of benevolence, and that will push out and replace any unwholesome thoughts. It's not actually possible to have a thought of loving kindness and a thought of ill will at the same time. So we substitute one for the other and he says it's like, um, I don't know if this makes sense in the modern world, but say there's say a step, that's the only thing I can think of, a step which you kind of make with wood and then you have to put something underneath the wood to keep it in place and there's a peg, like a wooden peg or something. And then he said it's like uh, you use a finer peg to knock out the coarse peg. Does that make sense? So it's like the coarse peg is, I don't know, a piece of wood. That's your coarse thought, which is very harmful. And then you use a finer one to knock it out. So you replace it with a, a thought of loving kindness. And then eventually, hopefully, you can move to even less thinking. So those thoughts are just kind of stepping stones, if you like, to a, a really quiet mind. And then the next one is, um, again, a very obvious wis wisdom aspect, which is seeing the danger in the thoughts. And here I feel that it doesn't only mean seeing the danger in unwholesome thoughts, but just seeing the danger in thoughts generally in the sense that they're not really reliable representations of the truth. They're very conditioned, they're very um, biased most of the time, incredibly subjective, um, and they tend to bend and twist the truth. My teacher Ajahn Brahm always says thoughts are one step away, at least, <laughs> from reality. Because reality, like bare experience, is something that's quite hard to put into words. Like how do you really describe, say, the feeling in your tummy right now? Kind of dull or kind of bubbly or... We don't really have language to describe these feelings correctly. Right? So it's an experience we can know. And whenever we put a label on something, it's always taking us a little step away from the experience of that. So obviously thoughts can spin all kinds of crazy stories and sometimes we're really off the mark. So <laughs> it can cause a lot of trouble. And it happens to the meditator, especially on longer retreats sometimes. You can get into whole stories about somebody else on the retreat and what they did and why they did it and they looked at you funny or <laughs> whatever. And you decide you don't like that person, you know. And then afterwards you talk to these people and they're just nothing like you thought. They're so kind or maybe you realize they're just quite fragile or they're going through a difficult time. You know, and you think, gosh, if I'd have known that, I might have had more compassionate, <laughs> uh, kind and, and generous thoughts. But we kind of form these stories and, you know, it is kind of like Mara getting involved, trying to prevent you from experiencing the peace of meditation. So, and the Buddha also said that um, even when we have wholesome thoughts, one of the dangers there is that still, even though there's no danger in the thought themselves, you know, it's good thoughts, it's not going to like defile, I don't like that word, it's not going to um, uh, bring up negative qualities in the mind, but, um, but still, if we think a lot, even good things, we get tired, our body's tired, and then he said our mind is far away from stillness, far away from one-pointedness. So we gradually kind of try to incline our mind to wholesome ways of thinking and then gradually let those thoughts go too. And then the next stage, if that doesn't work and if there are still difficulties with these uh, insistent, persistent thoughts, he said we can ignore those thoughts. And uh, I think this is a common strategy that's taught in most practices that maybe don't teach the direct addressing of thoughts is just to let them be there, but don't give them too much attention. So it's like your mind is this maybe big moon or something. That's my name actually, moon. <laughs> so imagine it's like a big, nice, white, shiny moon and the thoughts are kind of drifting across and you know causing a little bit of, uh, of uh, obscuration of the light or something. But you don't have to focus on them. There's other parts of the mind you can look at, the quiet parts of the mind or, you know, the shiny parts of the mind. And you can just let them be there and eventually they kind of fall off 
that disc, they just fall away. And I'm not talking about nimitters here, I'm just talking about one way you could visualize the mind. You could also see it like a, I don't like that one really, but a TV screen, it's often used. And uh, the thoughts just kind of fall off the edge of the screen. So we don't have to bother too much with them. Yeah, we can let them be. But of course, if it's persistent, I think it can be very helpful to then replace with a thought of loving kindness or a thought of compassion to oneself, especially if you're suffering from a particular pattern of thought. And then lastly, he says that we can, um, not exactly lastly, the last one is to suppress the thought with all your might, but this is, <laughs> this is meant as an emergency measure. If you're about to act on something really unwholesome, you just say, no, I will not follow that thought. But it's not a very skillful method in the practice to sit there and clench your teeth and, <laughs> and, and suppress the thought. So the last one that's really useful in meditation is to calm the thought formation, which to me, the way I work with that is to try and see the arising of the thought, how it arises. Also, it could include noticing whether the root of that thought is wholesome or not, but it's really to kind of catch it before it manifests fully into a verbalized thought. And uh, I guess this is easier for me to do on long retreats when the mind's pretty peaceful for long periods of time. And then sometimes I can experience a kind of bubbling up of something that wants to be said. And I can see that and just let it go. And it never actually manifests as a thought. So it's kind of like catching the train before it leaves the station and starts speeding down the track. You know, it's, it's stopping it earlier just by noticing that it's coming up in the mind. Most of the time we're like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and then we kind of go along with it and get in the train, let it take us a while down the track before we realize. And then it's quite hard to stop. Um, but these are sequential. So the Buddha is saying, first of all, start with replacing the unwholesome and then seeing the danger. And I think that's really a nice one to emphasize that um, we really can't trust our thoughts. Yeah. So when you take away the value from the thinking process, you know, you, you don't really believe in it so much, then it tends not to bother the mind. It tends not to carry you away into all these fanciful stories and fabrications of things that may never happen or did never happen <laughs> because you know so much of it is our conceptual mind just describing something that's far away from the reality of things so i would like to also say a little bit about happiness and the right kinds of happiness to pursue Please don't copy me by having a mobile phone in here, but I had to find this sutta because it's really beautiful. And it also undermines any belief that meditation shouldn't be pleasurable. I don't know if people have that here, but um, even if you know that it kind of should be or could be, sometimes we want to deny that to ourselves somehow because we don't think we're, we really deserve it or we think we're not good enough meditators and the bit of peace we have is not really anything to talk about. <laughs> but, um, but the Buddha does say that there's a kind of happiness that comes through meditation and it really should be pursued and cultivated. So in this sutta, it's Majjhima Nikaya 139, <laughs> especially for those listening, if you want to note it down. He says that one should know how to define pleasure and knowing that, one should pursue the pleasure within oneself and with reference to what was it said. So then the Buddha talks about the kind of pleasure that should not be pursued. There are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Now, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Okay, this language is a bit strong and it's not meant to be a judgment, but just to tell you there's something better. 
a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, developed or cultivated, that it should be feared. And fear here also, I don't think it's meant in a kind of um, religious, I don't want to name religions, but it's not a threat. It's more that we should be aware it may lead us in the wrong direction. And whilst I don't want to dilute any of the Buddha's teachings, because I think they leave us a lot to consider, I do want to point out that here it's not saying that it's terrible to enjoy your food or it's terrible to, you know, have relationships with someone you love and to show your you know, care for that person. But uh, it is saying it shouldn't be pursued and cultivated and developed. In other words, it's not really going to get you very far. So it's okay to enjoy ordinary pleasures of life like nature. I mean, some are much more uh, conducive to calming the mind than others. But if you really want to pursue the path and calm the mind and find that inner happiness, then the more you can simplify the life the more you can find delight in, in small things, you know, um, in kind gestures or in like little aspects of nature or whatever it is, then the more reliable that happiness is going to be and the more easily you can find it as well. It's like when the mind is very coarse, it needs gross excitement. Like some people have to, I don't know if they have to, but some people do this kind of throwing themselves off buildings and trying to get the parachute out in time. And it's really dangerous because they don't manage it all the time. <laughs> and you think, wow, you know, sometimes what, what it takes to feel that sense of thrill or to feel alive, you know, especially if we're depressed, right? Almost nothing can bring us out of that unless it's something kind of, I don't know, like binging on chocolate or movies or something. So that when the mind gets more refined, we start to see the pleasure in other things. We don't have to chuck ourselves off buildings or <laughs> engage in dangerous pursuits. So then he talks about the other kind of happiness. So here you'll see he's directly um, going the opposite way. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one abide, enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, and the fourth. So these are the deep states of samadhi, and hopefully I've discussed enough about that, that you know that these happinesses start before that. So there's some happiness to be found before then, but he's talking about deep happiness here. And he calls the kind of happiness of deep stillness, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, and the bliss of enlightenment. I say that this kind of pleasure should be pursued, should be developed, should be cultivated, and should not be feared. So if any of this happiness comes up in meditation, you don't need to worry about that. It's actually supposed to happen, and it's good when it happens. When it doesn't happen, it's fine too. <laughs> um, but that it's so close to the kind of freedom of enlightenment, he even calls it the bliss of enlightenment. And it's not enlightenment yet. There's an even deeper happiness that comes, which I have yet to taste, but I do know people who have tasted that, which is the bliss of being completely free from those roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. Completely free. Imagine if you had no greed, no craving. It would mean that you were fully content, right? If you are fully content, what's the need to crave? Or you've got everything you could ever possibly need. You know, my own teacher, and I don't want to make claims about his practice, but because uh, I don't know in detail. But uh, when you're around people like this and they relate to you so differently from the way anyone else relates, it's so interesting because his metta and compassion is just, to me, feels completely unconditional. And it's abundant. You know, he's there for me through thick and thin. But he also doesn't want or need anything from me whatsoever. Like there's absolutely no neediness to the point that if I died today or tomorrow or whenever, now, he'd probably think, oh, it's a shame because she could have done a bit more in this world. But, you know, it wouldn't affect it wouldn't affect his happiness, I'm pretty sure, which is quite incredible. And I mean that I don't mean to say that flippantly. Oh, it's just a shame. You know, certainly there'd be care, but there wouldn't be 
there'd be such deep wisdom knowing that people live and death is inevitable and we do the best we can with our lives while we're here that there would be an absolute peace around that and it's incredible to think that that can be a form of love isn't it because sometimes we think that love if we really love someone then we will suffer when they're not there but is that really love or is that clinging is that selfishness in a way not to condemn it because it's natural as long as we're still not enlightened you know, and I know that there are people on Zoom who've recently lost people very close to them, partners, mothers, even children. And they're going through immense amounts of grief. But one person did mention that uh, the grief is direct, it's, in, it's another form of love in a sense. Like you can interpret it as a measure of the love that you had for that person. And that's also a beautiful way of relating to an emotion that can feel afflictive and unwanted but holding that too in love and actually seeing it as an aspect of love. And of course, that is going to soften the grief. It's going to bring up the beautiful qualities, the gratitude, you know, the ability to <laughs> rejoice in what people have shared together in their lives. So, yeah, coming back in a way to the process of meditation and how we can work with that happiness in our practice is to just start noticing simpler happinesses. So obviously we've been working with metta and working with the breath and noticing that it's quite relaxing when the mind can just settle on a single breath. Even if it's only one breath or two breaths, it's quite relaxing in that moment, isn't it? Just to allow yourself to be breathed. You know, you don't have to do anything at that moment. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen later on it's just you can give yourself to the breath in this moment that's all you need to do there's a joy to that and when we stay with an object for longer and the mindfulness starts to develop using the breath or using loving kindness then we start to see more and more of that breath and it starts to interest the mind so in a sense we're coming away from the world of the senses onto this little part of the five sense world that is just maybe at this stage still the touch of the breath so we're moving out of the realm of the senses and into the realm of the mind and this is how we move from that second uh, tetrad of breath meditation where we're experiencing bliss with the breath into experiencing the mind that's the third um, tetrad of anapanasati we start to experience um, the breath through the mind sense door and that breath can start to shine or start to feel really full of um of bliss until it turns into maybe a radiant light in the mind and then you're actually experiencing it through the sense door of the mind so we're moving away from the five senses and into the sixth and starting to purify that so this is the stage of what we call nimittas which are like mental images in the mind, so often manifesting as lights, maybe dull lights in the beginning, maybe flashing lights or something unsteady. But over time, when the mind gets steady and simplifies and stays present, even sometimes when the breath disappears, nothing's going on. We don't see anything. It's just a kind of blank. But when the mind starts to um, notice more of what's happening, it might, may start to brighten up. And then... Uh, this is what the Buddha means, according to my understanding and my teacher's understanding of experiencing the mind. And then the mind is released, the last part of that tetrad, into the deep meditations, into the jhana states. And then we can experience that happiness of meditation. But it's important all along the way to notice these qualities of joy and happiness and you know, maybe a sense of relief or simplicity with the breath. And to remember to have that attitude of loving kindness all the time. Lastly, one aspect of that loving kindness that can be very, very useful with all kinds of meditation comes straight from the Metta Sutta, where the Buddha says one should be um, contented and easily satisfied, not proud or demanding in nature. So these are also qualities of loving kindness that we can apply to the breath not being proud or demanding like i've been meditating all these years you know i ought to get somewhere with this breath meditation come on breath 
you know, you're supposed to like settle down and turn into a bright light and bring all this bliss into my mind. We don't demand anything of our breath. We don't demand anything of our mind. And we're contented and easily satisfied, even if the breath comes just for a, a second. That's fine by us. It doesn't matter, right, what the object is, because we can still make peace with whatever's there. We can still develop contentment just with sitting quietly in the moment and perhaps also using the opportunity to send metta to someone we care for or to, to ourselves. So developing this contentment and being easily satisfied is such an important part of the path. And I think it's also related to patience. We're easily satisfied. We give things the time they need. So we give ourselves time to really develop that metta toward the breath and for the breath to start opening up to us and showing us the way to experience the mind. So this afternoon I will try and give a shorter talk and that is all for now. <laughs> but hopefully that can give you something to work with, not only now but in the future with your practice. So these retreats are quite short and I do tend to give quite a lot of uh, content and also a little bit of education around the Buddha's texts. But they're just things not to remember or to feel you have to use, but just things that might come up in your mind, um, even when you think you've forgotten them. And then you can just remember, oh yeah, I could add a word of metta here. Or yeah, it's okay to experience joy. So hopefully that will help process all right so if you would like to stretch a little bit and then we'll do some meditation so as usual please uh, invite your body to be as comfortable as it can be we'll be sitting about 40 minutes or so And just checking through your body with that care to see that it is at ease is part of establishing mindfulness in the beginning of the practice. Mindfulness of the body. And also setting up that right intention, the motivation of the mind to treat your body with kindness, with a sense of non-control, non-possession, but respecting this body as the vehicle for the practice, as belonging to nature, not belonging to you. And being gentle with your body, not always trying to push it to the limits, but maybe doing the opposite instead being more comfortable than you might normally feel you should be. And this helps to settle the mind and put it at ease so that you can let the body fade into the background. While you bring up thoughts of loving kindness, moods, maybe emotions of loving kindness, by noticing any place in the body, maybe around the heart area, which feels fairly at ease. Maybe there are pleasant feelings in the body. 
perhaps due to that kindness and care with which you've treated your body. Or perhaps due to the past two days of cultivating wholesome states of mind. So just connecting with whatever pleasant sensations you experience right now, or maybe sensations that are fairly neutral, not painful, but fairly easy to be with. And just relaxing with those. And also noticing the state of your emotional world right now. Whether your mind is peaceful or maybe restless. Energized or perhaps a little bit flat. Without judging the mind at all, but just noticing whether you might benefit from practicing loving kindness to prepare the mind for the breath. If so, then staying connected to your body and bringing up the loved person or the benefactor to mind. Getting a sense of their presence, maybe a visual image of their face, their being. And imagine greeting them with a smile of friendship and warmth. Maybe a smile on your face or from the heart. and this person smiling back at you. Sometimes this can be enough to generate feelings of loving kindness. Imagining that person relaxing, being more and more at ease, knowing they're in your loving company. And if you wish, you can offer them some good wishes by bringing thoughts of loving kindness to mind. Thoughts that relate to them as individual human beings. Thoughts that really encapsulate your deepest wishes for their well-being, such as may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you be free. Choosing your own phrases, or if your mind is fairly quiet, you may even choose just a single word such as happy or content. Or 
always listening, feeling into the resonance of those words, those wishes in your own heart. So we say the phrase or the word and then become silent and allow those words or phrases to direct the mind towards the feeling, the experience of loving kindness before planting another phrase. like planting seeds of love in the heart. Sometimes when the mind quietens, we naturally start to experience the breathing. If the mind feels drawn to the breath as an object of simplifying the mind, quietening the mind, then allow the breath to come in. Always treating the breath the way you treat the loved person. Smiling from the heart at that breath. Treating the breath as a friend. just as you would never force a friend to stay by your side. We don't force the breath into the mind or the mind onto the breath. We don't demand the breath be long or short. All breaths, whether long or short, <laughs> rough or smooth, all breaths are welcome in the mind.
And if you find that the breath is present for you, <clears throat> yet it's sometimes hard to stay with the breath, you might even wish to add a word to the breath. Breathing in peace. Breathing out love or contentment, whatever works for you.
And whether you have met a, a loved person or the breath in mind or any other object, see if you can notice the space between that object and your mind and notice how you're relating to it. Is there clinging, frustration, force? Is there anything you can let go of? Can you be more gentle, more accepting of the mind? And you may notice that whenever you relax and let go, develop contentment with whatever is here. There's a deepening of happiness, a deepening of peace. So allow the mind to open to that peace, that joy. No matter how humble or subtle it may be.
we're coming close to the end of the meditation now. Although if you wish to continue until lunchtime, you can. Just notice now the condition of your mind compared to when you began the meditation. Are you a little more peaceful, quiet, joyful? And noticing your body, whether it's become more relaxed and at ease. And we can end the meditation by generating the intention to share whatever peace and harmony, whatever happiness and peace we've experienced now with all beings, with everyone here meditating together in this room, with our fellow retreatants on Zoom, among and between us, may we all experience peace. May I share the goodness of my practice, the goodness of my life with all beings May they also experience peace, harmony, contentment in their lives. May all beings be safe, be healthy, be free. So it's always nice to do a few minutes of metta, of sharing the merits, sharing the happiness in your heart, the peace, no matter how subtle, how unremarkable you may feel that it is still. Sharing that with all living beings. and resolving to nurture and cherish that peace in your heart as you move out of this meditation and into some walking meditation and through the break. Guarding that peace as though it were a very valuable treasure in your heart. So I'm going to ring the bell three times. You may hear it on Zoom today, but otherwise <laughs> you can just take three breaths or allow three more breaths into your mind and then gently open your eyes. So before you do 
gently, carefully, mindfully move and go into the walking meditation. I would like to invite whoever wishes to um, take a little piece of paper outside. There's a little square bits of paper and if you want to share your deep aspiration for next year, some beautiful intention that you have that you want to bring into the next year. Just one, and maybe one thing that you'd like to let go of. And you can do it the other way around. So maybe first write down something you'd like to let go of. It could be something physical or emotional or whatever it is, a relationship, an attitude, a habit pattern of mine and something that you want to bring forward into the new year and we'll share those at around hmm, let's see if we can try and be a little bit earlier for the afternoon session maybe could we have the half hour sit half hour quiet sit from about 10 to till 20 past one would that work there's an optional silent sitting here at that time. 10 to until 20 past one for anyone who feels they want a bit more peace and quiet. And please keep this room reserved for that. So no writing or reading or maybe even sleeping at that time. So from 10, uh, 10 to one until 20 past one and then we'll meet here at about 25 past and I'll read some of those out. And also on the Zoom, I will invite your um, aspirations, intentions and things to let go of as well. And we'll try and keep it pretty short. So I'll just read out a few. I might not get through 80 people on Zoom, <laughs> but just to share, just to share a few of those before we do some more Dhamma reflection. Okay. Is that all good? Any questions? Any doubts? Excellent. So this is the last day, so please see if you can contain that silence and continue the mindfulness throughout the day. You'll get more results that way in your daily life. Thank you very much. Enjoy your walking. <laughs>